community, we live our message of hope, love, justice, and joy. We extend a special welcome to our visitors this morning. We're very happy that you've joined us, and we'd love to get to know more about you after the worship service. If you haven't already, please stop by the newcomer table just outside those back doors in Robinson Lounge so that we can get you any information that you like about our congregation. Happenings uh, in your order of service in the back has tons of announcements about the many activities that are happening at UU Princeton, including a few that are today. The first is that we hope you'll join us for brunch today at 1130, right after worship, as the mu music ministry invites you to enjoy an extra special menu. Many of you know that our musicians are a refined culinary bunch with very delectable offerings. For this Sunday's brunch, however, our food prep is joined by another wonderful ministry here at UU Princeton, our Racial Justice Ministry Indigenous Peoples Concerns Group. Uh, and that's because at 1230 today, that group will host the Coalition of Native Women and Allies for a screening and discussion of their film, What We Weren't Taught in School. As an accompaniment to the film, the brunch will include a sampling of Native American food, a three sisters stew of squash, corns, and beans with cornbread catered by the racial justice group. So brunch at 1130, film and discussion at 1230. As usual, donations for the brunch are greatly appreciated. Lots of wonderful stuff happening here at UU Princeton today. Also, the Women's Alliance cordially invites you to join us this Thursday, November 16th, for more brunch, more food, and followed by a magical journey to Japan with UU Princeton member Doug Ratke. Doug will show photos from a cultural trip to Japan's main island of Honshu and various cities and towns all over Japan where he went. The journey will end in the city of Hiroshima, which honors its past with the Peace Memorial Museum and Peace Park. You can bring a sandwich or salad to share for lunch at noon, and then the program begins at one. That's this Thursday. No reservation needed. And then on Friday, you'll be back with us. This one's only on Zoom, though. You can do it from your own home. Join the UU Princeton Rainbow Ministry Transgender Day of Remembrance Observance. This was started in 1999 by transgender advocate Gwendolyn Ann Smith as a vigil to honor the memory of Rita Hester. It has grown to be a worldwide observance, and our observance will be on Friday, this Friday, November 17th at 6 p.m. on Zoom. We'll send out a Zoom link sometime this week, so keep an eye out for that email. We'd love to see you there. The last, a quick change to your order of service. We all love our bell choir, but sadly, Joel Piercy is under the weather and can't be here today. So we have different music where the bell choir is listed in your order. But fear not, the bell choir will be back and the bell choir will rock again pretty soon. And now centered in love, growing in hope and creating community, let us be together in joy grateful for life and always reaching for greater peace. Come, let us worship together. The important thing is to not stop questioning. Curiosity has its own reason for existing. One cannot help but be in awe when he contemplates the mysteries of eternity, of life, of the marvelous structure of reality. It is enough if one tries merely to comprehend a little of this mystery every day. Never lose a holy curiosity. And that's from Albert Einstein. In honor of Tidor, we want to offer something a little different. The LGBTQIA plus community at large, and the trans community in particular, are experiencing crushing amount of trauma. There is no denying the harm that is being done to our brothers and our sisters. Layers of intersectional oppression and trauma are affecting our window of tolerance. That is the range of emotion experiences and stresses we can tolerate comfortably without being agitated or shutting down. One way we widen our window of tolerance is prayer and meditation. Unfortunately, the ability to sit quietly and be present enough to meditate is one of the first things to go, especially when we don't feel safe. 
So today I would like to offer a trauma-informed guided meditation that is very short and easy and aim to widen everybody's window of tolerance with a particular thought to our trans siblings who need it. A modified version is printed in your order of service, so you can try it at home and pass it on to whoever you think might need it. So first of all, I'm not gonna ask you to close your eyes and I'm not gonna ask you to relax. We're going to create an anchor and then I'm gonna share a meditation that is about 90 seconds. And if any of it is not right for you right now, that's okay. Just be gentle and kind with yourself. We're gonna take a second and pay attention to our feet how they feel in our shoes. Are they cold? Are they hurt? Is there room for your toes to wiggle? Where does your soul touch your shoe? And where does your shoe touch the ground? This will be our anchor. If anything is too much, if being present is too hard, you can gently bring yourself back here. And even after the service, you can always come back to this when you did a little magic in your day to stay grounded. Now let's take a breath together and let it all out again. You are beloved, you are held, you are safe. I want you to turn your attention to the chalice. And I would like you to imagine how many steps it would take from exactly where you are to be close enough to smell the wax melting, to feel the warmth on your face. How many floorboard would gently creak on the way? How many rows are between now and knowing that you belong? How many people will you see smiling back at you before we are one? How many moments between here and knowing that you are loved, that you are loved? How many rays of sunshine can you let in to light your spirit? And how much warmth can you carry out? You are safe. You are held. You are beloved. Thank you. Every time I looked at my kitchen, I would ask myself, why? Why is it always such a mess? Why could I never be bothered to close the cabinet doors? Why was I so bad at this? Why was I such a mess? I'm so incredibly grateful to be able to choose to be a homemaker. But even after 20 years of practice, I just sucked at it. Not for lack of trying though. I've tried every routine, bought more cleaning supplies than I care to admit. And I'm still convinced there's an organizing bin out there that will solve all my problems. The same question kept coming again and again. Why am I struggling so much? Why am I like this? 
The only answer that made sense was that I was the problem. I was deficient and therefore inadequate. Cue the litany of negative self-talk. I'm lazy, irresponsible, immature. I'm not clever enough to figure this out. I felt like I was failing. And the only answer I had was shame. By myself, I was stuck. Thankfully, I am desperately addicted to the endless font of Millennium Wisdom that is YouTube. And I started listening to other people's perspective. Why do I need a perfectly clean kitchen? Maybe there was something more to this. I had tried long enough to guilt myself into doing the right thing. And I was ready to try something different. I was finding communities of people claiming that dirty dishes did not make me a bad person. That I could choose what works for me rather than follow some cosmic rule. And by cosmic, I mean, of course, my mother's. As it turns out, I really do like my kitchen clean, not just to prove to my next visitor that I have my life under control, but because I feel more agitated and unsettled when my space is unsettled. I also cook a lot less if my kitchen is not in decent shape, and I really like cooking. I was finding answers that were both kind and supportive. Why do I need so many systems, hacks, shortcuts, and weird incentives? I have to treat myself like a five-year-old to get anything done. Clean your room, get a lollipop. Getting what I now knew I wanted was taking a lot more energy than I thought it, it should. I started listening to the ADHD community, thinking that they would have the good stuff. If someone could help me with routines and motivations, surely they would. I recognized so much of my own struggles and behaviors in what I was hearing that I ended up getting diagnosed with ADHD. It was a productive but heartbreaking answer. And I spent some time in sorrow trying to answer to God and to myself why I had treated myself so badly for such a long time. The answers were coming more easily now, and the questions themselves started to shift. Why do I keep forgetting to close the cabinet doors? Wait, why do I need cabinet doors at all? Most people will tell you that open cabinets are a recipe for disaster especially for self-described slobs. Except if I can't see what is in the cabinet, it ceases to exist. I can't quite describe the exhilaration and the relief of taking those stupid doors off. Now that I can see everything, I really enjoy keeping the shelves organized and making them pretty. And maybe it's time to stop calling myself a slob. Why do I get so overwhelmed with the amount of stuff that I have? Because I have too much stuff. The, answer are start the answers are starting to feel more natural. I am not the problem. The problem is that I own 56 plates in the desperate hope that it will stop me from running out of clean ones. But all it did was allow me to make bigger and bigger towers of dirty plates. That became harder and harder to manage. It turns out we need six in my household. Yes, six plates is our magic number. I have finally established the habit of running the dishwasher every day. Not because I must, but because it's painless there's only ever six dirty plates. And I can see them in my now doorless cabinets. And I have practiced finding better answers enough that when we do occasionally run out, no one feels the need to beat themselves up about it.
Thank you, Audrey, for that great reflection and for the meditation earlier in the service. Thank you as well to Rainbow Ministry for partnering in that and for offering the vigil again this Friday, 6 p.m., only on Zoom. Keep an eye on your email for your link. Questions. Two people have a conversation in which they only try to ask each other questions. Each question has to relate to the previous question. There can't be non sequiturs. Hesitation in responding is penalized. Statements instead of questions are penalized. And repeating a question is also penalized. There are other rules too, but each penalty adds a point. And in the way we played it in drama club in high school, the first person to 10 lost. 10 penalties, you lose the game. That sounds like it might take a while, but it doesn't. It's difficult to follow question after question after question without hesitation or without stating something. And it always helped to have a referee present for there would be disagreement about what constituted hesitation and a non sequitur. Statements were more obvious to penalize. An example of the game could be, what would you like for dinner? That's fine. Why are we planning dinner? That's also fine. Why do we have to eat dinner? That's good. What time are we eating dinner? Those are all penalty-free questions, but then the next one might be, what will we fix dinner? Which repeats the initial question, and so that player receives a penalty point. We started passing time playing this game in theater after some of us read Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. An existential, strange play by Tom Stoppard first performed in the 1960s when there were lots of strange existential plays. This one is built around two minor characters in Shakespeare's Hamlet and is staged at first and at the end in the wings of a production of Hamlet, sort of a play within a play thing. And the setting changes midway to reflect the arc of Hamlet, or maybe it doesn't, it all might be imagined, or the two characters could be two sides of one person and maybe this is all someone's inner monologue, who knows, it's experimental after all. No one really knows what's going on or is supposed to. It has a tragic and powerful ending, but gets there through the comic and the absurd and does that cool thing of lifting two easy to miss characters from a well-known play into their own worlds. I, I like those works. That play starts with this game in which they both have a bag of coins. We join mid-game when Guildenstern pulls a coin from his bag, flips it, it lands on heads, and so Rosencrantz gets the coin. They do this many times. The total gets to 92. The coin always lands on heads, so Rosencrantz always gets the coin, leading his bag to be nearly full while Guildenstern's bag is almost empty. The coins only ever go one way. Opportunities for social commentary, abound. The game is clearly unfair or rigged or something is off, but both just keep playing it, noting and discussing the absurdity, but playing the game nonetheless, because I guess, what are you going to do? They have a lot in life, a script to follow, and follow it they will, as we learn at the end of the play. But before they get, but before that, they also get to play questions, which is how we came across the game in high school. A short piece of their game, which is longer in the play, begins with Rosencrantz saying, could we play questions? Guildenstern, what good would that do? Rosencrantz, practice. Guildenstern, statement, one love. Rosencrantz, cheating. Guildenstern, how? Rosencrantz, I hadn't started yet. Guildenstern, statement, two love. Rosencrantz, are you counting that? Guildenstern, what? Rosencrantz, are you counting that? Guildenstern, foul, no repetitions, three, love, three, love. <laughs> Guildenstern is awful at the coin game, but he's really good at questions. He's bad in luck, but he's blessed in agency. The questions game shows in a fun way how difficult it can be to stay centered in wonder, to practice wonder when assertion feels more natural, to adopt a posture of curiosity that becomes so comfortable that our response to something might not be immediate negation or affirmation or urgent enhancement or anxious fixing, but just being present to its questions by asking and inviting more of them. The game asks us to respond to life and one another with a kind of curiosity, an ethic of wonder, a practice of asking questions and seeing where the journey goes. Religion is typically understood to be more about making assertions. It's more about conveying an understanding of history, tenets of beliefs, terms of behavior, and in most Western faiths, the eventual disposition of the soul. 
And in the process of learning these teachings and structures, questions asked often by the young tend to be headed for long supported institutional answers. That's institutionally. Interpersonally, the process is relational and dynamic and fun, especially with the young. A Sunday school teacher, for example, learns more and has more fun teaching than they do by diving into any institutional tome. That's true in any faith and in our faith. But institutionally, questions are encouraged in general religious thought insofar as they lead the questioner to the accepted terms of faith shared by the body now and in times past. And truly, I'm not really even mad at that anymore. It's exactly what some people want. They want to have questions answered by tradition and scripture and authority. They're not looking for a journey as much as the destination, and they want clear directions on how to get there. And they do want to go there with others. That's why they're choosing any religion in today's age. But the openness of the more liberal approaches to theology and belief in religious community is not something that works for everyone. I love it. We love it. It fosters a central sense of freedom that we value, even if in excess we become a bit over individualistic than we need to be. It's still easy on the whole, a value, easily on the whole, a value worth proclaiming and defending for us and for all, for in how we use it, when we use it well, it, it allows everyone to live a more liberated life. Liberation, a frequent value shared in our faith today, is rooted in freedom, which is a value that we've long embraced and shared. Our terms change as they do, but the values hold longer than any one of us will. The Unitarian minister Wallace Robbins of the 20th century spoke to this approach, writing, we dare not fence the spirit, nor close off the sincerity of conversation with which souls must meet in religious association. As others have their ways of religion, so do we have this faith, and in honest difference, we order our lives together. He was speaking about our spiritual diversity, our multiple understandings of all things holy, of how we order our lives in ways that allow that diversity to bring us together. We seek it, we crave it, we learn from it, we enjoy it, we live it in ways that let us pray diversely and together, that let us serve a God or gods or goodness in ways that unite in the active blessing of the world, that let us enact out of devotion or ethics peace in a world of ongoing violence, that let us sing with many voices one hymn of unending love. Why a hymn of love? Because as Carl Sagan wrote, for small creatures such as we, the vastness is bearable only by love. Our love is of freedom and liberation and more values and the open-minded pursuit of their guidance and embrace so that we can live lives of service to them is the way of liberal religion. But Robbins isn't saying that it's the way for everyone. He acknowledges that others have their ways of religion, which reminds us that those ways work for other people as does ours for us. No judgment needed. We can be better neighbors than that only blessings on everyone's journey. After all, we're not worried about anyone's soul. God's love takes care of all of that. We want people to live full and rich lives of community and joy right here and now. And we celebrate that there are many paths that can help people do that. And our approach does value the questions and embraces different answers and responses. It's not really like the questions game when we grow together in where we would grow together in spirit by relentlessly questioning one another. That wouldn't be peaceful at all if we just peppered each other with question after question after question about prayer or devotion or whatever. Anyone who has parented or spent more than a minute with a kid knows that a cute question or two can become kind of exhausting when turned into an endless litany of why, 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 especially when the litanies come in the middle of everything else that's going on. Why are pizzas round? Oh, that's a cute question. I'm not really sure, maybe because it's fun to eat triangles. Why do we eat them as triangles? Maybe so everyone gets some crust. Why is there crust? Because it's pizza, not soup. Why isn't pizza soup? Because you don't eat it with a spoon. What do we eat it with? Properly only our hands, but with some a fork. A big fork or a little fork? You know, it's time to set the table. Could you please help with that? Sometimes our questions can build and build and we may need to ease up a bit. 
As with anything, moderation can not only be helpful, but kind of compassionate sometimes. And if the topics are matters of the spirit, then a gentler, open-minded humility and sense of moderation are even more important in our questions than if we're talking about pizza. Although I learned from worship last November that y'all have some strong opinions about cranberry sauce. And I learned a few weeks ago that y'all also have some strong opinions about how to make a taco and what goes on it. You probably have strong opinions about pizza too, don't you? You probably do. Food is like the third rail of this pulpit sometimes, I think. And the questions we ask of one another and our neighbors and our friends, if we ask open, honest, considerate questions when we might otherwise assert something, they just help us remember that we don't know everything. Even if we know the subject and have strong opinions about it, we don't know what the other person is living through or has gone through or how they arrived where they are. And the faith that values honest relational questions can lead us to accept deeper realities than opinions and preferences, which are often just the surface level of someone's life. A take, an opinion, an assertion is necessarily shallow, but we shouldn't forget that there's always a deeper life expressed always incompletely by those words. Just as the truth of the holy is not contained in any holy book, so too is the truth that we are not contained in any single utterance. And while learning about our depths may not lead to agreement, it will lead to understanding, which is often phrased as mutual understanding or relationship building in a widely shared expression of a value in our faith, even more so than agreement. On any particular topic, we're the ones who value this kind of diversity. That mutual understanding can be fostered by asking the right kinds of questions in the right kinds of ways. Questions also drive progress in our faith and reason and evolution, all values. Progress in the sense of moving forward, reason as a critical, creative engagement with information and wisdom, and evolution as the reality that things are always changing, always growing, primarily in response to forces much larger than us, but also directly affected by us. This leads us to embrace movement where we can, to embrace our minds and what they can offer, and embrace change, especially the kind of change that we can influence, however small it might be. The pra practice of asking compassionate, thoughtful, other-centered questions can prompt each of these values toward greater expression. It's understandable to want answers. And indeed, we are drawn to seek and to offer them. And if doing so, even if doing so causes us to lose the questions game. And to be sure, life is always to be lived in a certain balance. And there are seasons and moments for declarations and assertions, like God is love, like you are forgiven, like you've got this, like I do. But a life of thoughtful questions in balance with the need to sometimes declare opens doors of wonder and of why. It brings us to one another. It allows breathing space for new wisdom. The question is the empty page of the journal, the empty space we can treat with curiosity and wonder and holiness, the sacred text we can write and revise and join with others in creating an ongoing testament to the goodness of a life lived together. Rilke, the 19th and 20th century Austrian poet who was Christian and something of a mystic said it well. He wrote these words to a young poet who was eager to figure everything out quick, fast, and in a hurry. The young poet wanted to create now and wanted it to be good. And so he struck up a correspondence with this older esteemed and successful writer who wrote back to him, Try to love the questions themselves, as if they were locked rooms or books written in a very foreign language. Don't search for the answers, which could not be given to you now because you would not be able to live them. And the point is to live everything. Live the questions now. Perhaps then, someday far in the future, you will gradually, without even noticing it, live your way into the answer. 
May our holy questions lead us to spaces of change and peace and joy. And as we live our questions, may they bring us together closer with one another and in wider company with all of our neighbors. May we proclaim the love that is at the center of our faith and listen with wonder and joy and curiosity about how that lives in many other lives. May it be so, and amen. And at the end of our hour, we extinguish our chalice, knowing that its light carries us until we gather again. Go forth grateful for the moments before you, the breath within you, the people among you, and the spirit guiding you toward lives of love and kindness. And go forth knowing that you are held always and always with everyone else by that great love of no beginning and never ending. Go in peace and amen. <laughs>